If you would, open with me in your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians 10 and Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at our, our key texts again tonight. If you're new here tonight, we're in the middle of a series going through uh, and looking at what the Bible says about spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. And we are all engaged in spiritual warfare whether we recognize it or not, and hopefully we can recognize it so that we can be victorious. And that's God's design, that's God's plan and purpose for all of us, is that in the spiritual battles that we fight, that we would, like Christ, be victorious. Amen? And so we've been looking at some of the different armaments, some of the different weapons that God has equipped us with, which we can fight against the devil. And so 2 Corinthians 10 and Ephesians 6 really are the cornerstone verses for spiritual warfare. And uh, tonight we're looking specifically at what's called the sword of the spirit from Ephesians 6, the sword of the spirit. But before we get to that, again, I want to read this passage from 2 Corinthians 10 and then the whole passage in Ephesians chapter 6. So 2 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 3. Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The the spiritual warfare is not an earthly combat. It's not a a material combat. It is spiritual warfare. So verse 4 he says, so the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10, and let's go now to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and starting here in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... Firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that as we study it tonight, Lord, that these truths would come alive to us. Lord, that it wouldn't just be words written on a page, but it would be your word pressed deep into our hearts. Lord, that would bear good fruit in our lives and in your kingdom. Lord, as Paul talks about here, being able to stand in an evil day, Lord, we see and recognize that the days that we are living in are evil. And it is your desire that your people would stand in that day, Lord, that we would not bend, that we would not bow, that we would not hide, that we would not retreat, but that we would march forward victoriously, waging this battle that you have called us to wage with the power of your spirit and the sword of the spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand how to do that more effectively in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We do live in evil days. Uh, Not a week goes by that I don't see some news story, some headline, some Instagram videos, some Twitter posts of something happening in our culture that just, I'm shocked. I can't believe it. I can't believe what my eyes are seeing. Every day it's almost, I say, I thought I had seen it all. And then tomorrow brings some new horrific atrocity happening in our world, happening in our culture. 
things that are just blatantly evil, what the Bible would call abominations to God, are, are being celebrated and applauded in our culture today. Uh, it does feel like, though uh, the majority of people in our culture, in our nation, would profess Christ, would profess, would make a profession of faith, it, it doesn't appear that many people are holding on to that profession. It doesn't appear that many people in our day are living according to the word of God. And so for us who are here tonight, and I know here at Destiny Church slash Christ is King Church as we're making this transition, we are a people who hold fast to what God's word says. Amen? And we feel like, and it can feel like, we're in a minority. It could feel like as we look in a world and a culture that celebrates evil, it, it, can, it, it can feel like the, the world is trying to make us think that we're the crazy ones. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, man, when everybody else is celebrating evil and you're sitting there thinking, how is this possible? It can feel like that the enemy is trying to attack us and make us feel like we are the crazies. That's not the case. We just live in an evil day. But God has called us as his people to be strong. To be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And in that might to stand. To stand, to take a stand for Christ, to take a stand on his word, to destroy strongholds and arguments and everything that would try to exalt itself against Christ. And all of us, all of us are called to play a part in that. And so God has given us this armor. Paul says, therefore, take up the armor of God. And, and we've walked through and we've, we've looked at each of these pieces of the armor of God and we've seen how the, 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 the way that Paul uses the, 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 the natural to describe the, the spiritual helps us to understand these truths. And I would encourage you, if, if you've missed any of these sessions, to go back on our website to watch them. That, there's, that There is a lot of great practical truth for you to grab a hold of as we've gone through this series. I was going to recap it tonight, but... I want us to be able to go home at a decent hour. So we're just going to get to the sword of the spirit, if, if that's all right tonight. Paul doesn't leave it up to interpretation what the sword of the spirit is. He just flatly says it. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. With the, with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the gospel shoes, it's it was kind of up to a little bit of, you had to do a little bit more work, a little bit more interpretation, a little bit more reading and studying. How, how, how does this play out? But with the sword of the Spirit, he wants to make sure that he is abundantly clear. There is no question that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And in this whole suit of armor... Again, all of these armaments, these belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, all of those things are defensive mechanisms. They, they protect us, and we've looked at that, how these, these armaments, as we utilize them, they protect us against the attacks of the enemy. But here now, at the end, Paul lists the one weapon that we have in this suit of armor. And this weapon is not for defense. This weapon is for offense. This weapon is for going on the attack. And what we need to understand is that when we fight spiritual battles, the one weapon we have is the word of God. It is the word of God. The word is our weapon. The word is our weapon. This is what we fight with. The word of God. The fact that we're given a weapon tells us, tells me, 
that we are supposed to go on the attack. We are supposed to launch offensives going against dark demonic forces and powers. If the church was only to play offense, uh, defense rather, if the church was only to play defense, there would be no sword of the spirit mentioned. There would be no weapon mentioned in this armor of God. But this weapon is for us to go on the offensive. David says in Psalm 144, 1, he says, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Of course, as we read in 2 Corinthians 10, the battles that we fight, they're not natural. We're not talking about a natural sword. We're not talking about natural weapons. We're talking about spiritual battles. But this is not the only passage here, Ephesians 6, that talks about the word of God being like a sword. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The Bible in multiple places refers to the word of God as a sword, as a weapon. The thing is about a sword, if we're going to use the sword of the spirit, to use a sword, you must do what with it? You must pick it up. Amen? Amen? You, you, you can't use a sword that you're not holding. The, the, the sword will do you little good if it's tucked away in the closet somewhere. Likewise, the sword of the Spirit will do you and your family little good if it just sits on the bookshelf, if it just collects dust. It's not going to do you any good if the Word is only between the two leather flaps. That's not going to do any good if it's only here. The word must be in our hands. We must pick it up if we're going to use the sword of the spirit. To, to use any weapon, you must hold on to it. To be, an effect, to be effective with a sword or any weapon, it must become an extension of who you are. You must train with that weapon. If you're going to be an effective with any weapon, you must train with it until it becomes second nature to you. Until you don't even have to think and it's just, it's there, it's there, it's there. Now that's why when you enlist in the armed forces, they put you through basic training, don't they? They strip you down so that they can build you back up. That, that's what we need as Christians. When we come to Christ, we leave our old life behind. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. That he died with Christ in baptism and he has been raised to new life so that Christ can now live through us. They, they, they don't just, when you enlist in the army, they don't just send you to the front lines and say, good luck. No, they put you through some training until you become second nature. Because when, when things happen on the battlefield, natural and spiritual, they can happen so quickly that you don't even have time to think. You, you have to be ready to use your weapon. I recently came across this brief video clip. I want to show it to you. I hope that you don't feel this is too offensive to show in church, but it shows the dedication of our armed forces to master their weapon. And I only show this video to you not to praise our armed forces, but to simply say, if they are so dedicated to their natural weapon, how much more? should we be devoted to developing skills with our spiritual weapon, the Word of God? If they are so devoted 
so that they might win a natural battle, how much more when we are fighting battles of eternal consequence? And so I want to show you this video. It's only about 90 seconds. I hope that it will inspire you to devote time to the Word of God. How many of you know those guys are dangerous, right? They're dangerous. I would not want to face one of those guys in battle. We should be as equally dangerous with the sword of the Spirit. Amen? And and as equally well trained. They, They know their weapon front and back. They could do that in their sleep. We need to be just as trained and skilled, if not more, in the Word of God that we would know it front and back. You will not, hear hear this, you will not win spiritual battles if you are unskilled with the word of God. And we are all in spiritual battles. And we will, you cannot win a battle if you don't know how to use your weapon. And so we must become skilled in using the sword of the spirit. Amen? Amen? The Bible talks about two ways about becoming skilled with the Word of God. Two two ways in using the sword of the Spirit. And I want to share those with you here tonight. Two, Two ways that it talks about the Word of God. The first is that it talks about the Word in our heart. The Word in our heart. Go with me to uh, Psalm chapter 119. Psalm 119. No, I'm not going to read the whole thing tonight. I know I've done that before, but I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to do that tonight. Psalm 119, just a few verses. If you don't know where Psalm 119 is, it's the, kind of in the, almost in the middle of the Bible. It's the longest chapter in the book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, uh, and the book of Psalms, chapter 119. Psalm 119, verse 9, it says this, How can a young man keep his way pure? What a great question, as we live in a very evil day with temptation everywhere and opportunity to sin everywhere. How can a young man stay pure before the Lord? Well, he says, by guarding it according to your word. How can you keep your life pure? By using the sword of the Spirit, by guarding your life according to the Word of God, by guarding your life with the sword of the Spirit. He goes on to say, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11, I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The first way that the Bible talks about the the word 
And using the word as a sword, it, it's, it's keeping it in our heart. It's putting the word in our heart. And the word in our hearts keeps us from sin. We must learn to apply the word to our own lives. This is where we start. This is where we start with the sword of the Spirit, is applying it in our own lives that we might gain victory over sin. Amen? God's desire for us is not that we would be bound in sin for all of our days. Jesus came to set us free from sin. Amen? And if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. And so we can have victory over sin in our lives. Now, I'm not saying that you will never sin, but what I am saying is that when you do, that you are victorious over it, that it is not mastering you. And it is the word of God and hiding it in our hearts and staying close to his commandments and seeking him with our whole heart and guarding our lives with the sword of the spirit that keeps us from sin and gives us the victory over sin. Psalm 37, 1 says this, the law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The law of God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Is the law of God in your heart? Has God written his law on your heart? Have you taken God's word? Have you applied it? Have you, have you meditated on it? Have you, have you has, as he says, meditating on his commandments? Have you done that? That is the first step to standing on a sure and solid ground. Psalm 40, verse 8, he says, I delight to do your will. Oh, my God, your law is within my heart. This is step one. This is step one to becoming skilled with the word of God is you must hide it in your heart. There's no shortcuts here. I wish I could just plug all your brains in like the matrix and download the Bible to you. I wish I could do that. There's no shortcuts. There's, you must hide it in your heart. I know this is really simple. And, and, and sometimes I think we want things to be more complicated than, than they really are. God has made this very simple. It's not complicated. But it takes work. And it takes discipline. I'm not talking about earning your righteousness. I'm not talking about earning your salvation. We know that Christ has done that for us. We know that because of his work on the cross where he says it is finished, the, the work is done in securing our salvation. And we rest in that. We rest in that. But we are still under spiritual attack. Even though we are saved, we can still be led astray. We can still be deceived. We can still make shipwreck of our lives through sin. We can still ruin the legacy that God would have us leave to our children and grandchildren. Even though we are saved, even though we are forgiven of sin. We, we need to live life with a, a mindset of being victorious over sin in our lives. It's not complicated, but it does take work and discipline to hide God's word in your heart. The only way for God's word to get into you is that you must get into God's word. That's it. How do I hide God's word in my heart? How do I get God's word into me? You must get into God's word. That's it. And so the, the issue is, are you in the word of God? If you're not in the word, you're not going to be skilled with the sword, and you are going to be open to the attacks of the enemy. The only way for God's word to get into you is you must get into God's word. I'm going to give you seven ways to do that here tonight. 
Number one, faithfully attending worship gatherings. That's what you're doing right here, right now, right? Are you not getting into God's word right now? Is God's word not getting into you right now? Absolutely. You, we need to prioritize gathering for worship where we hear the word of God preached. And let me encourage you, when you come, come anticipating, I'm going to hear from God's word and I want to apply it to my heart today. Amen? Amen. Secondly, King's Bible Institute, our two-year Bible program. Many of you have gone through it. Many of you are in it. It is excellent. It is an excellent way to get God's word into you. King's Bible Institute, can I get an amen from all the, yeah, amen, King's Bible Institute. Number three, Bible Study Fellowship, BSF. BSF is a ministry that takes place, it's international, uh, but it takes place in churches all over our city. You can sign up for Bible Study Fellowship. Heather's been doing that. She loves it. I know Dave Fisher does that. Uh, Steve Guajardo is a big part of that. Where's Steve at? Steve Guajardo, if you want to know about Bible Study Fellowship, go talk to Steve Guajardo. They have meetings all over the city, all kinds of different times, women's groups, men's groups, stuff for kids. They have times that will fit your schedule. If, if KBI doesn't work or you've already been through KBI, man, find another time to get into God's Word. They're going to be starting the Gospel of John in September? Starting the Gospel of John, they're going to spend the next year or so, nine months, going through John's Gospel. Bible Study Fellowship. They even have stuff, certain groups where you can go with your kids. They take your kids. Husbands go here. Mommies go there. And everybody learns the Word of God together. That's a great way to get into the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Listen to the Word of God. Listen. You can, you can just pull up the Bible app. You can hit play on it. And you, while you're driving, while you're sleeping, while you're brushing your teeth, while you're doing whatever, you can be getting God's word into your heart. Number five, get in a community group. We have great community groups that meet here where they go into the word, they encourage one another. That's where iron sharpens iron as you study the word in community. That's number five. Number six, you could start your own Bible study. In your home, invite your neighbors over, invite your friends over. At work, with your family, start your own Bible study that you lead. You want to talk about forcing you to get into the Word? When you start leading, when you start leading others, it will force you into the Word. That's something that you could do. Uh, the, the Romo family has done that for years in their home. They just open their home. They invite people over for Bible study. All kinds of people that haven't been a part of the church, that are hurt from the church, not, not this church, but they've been hurt in other places, and they come and they hear and receive the word of God. People that would never darken the doors of a church. I, I want to encourage you, think about, consider, pray about starting a Bible study where you are with the people that you know. That'll get God's word into you. And number seven, you could ask someone who's more mature in the faith, someone who uh, has, has lived faithfully for the Lord, you could ask them to consider to disciple you in the Lord, where you would sit under them and they would train you in walking with the Lord and using the word of God. That's just seven very quick ways. But we have in our, in our day and age, in our time, we have more ways and opportunities to get into the word of God than any other previous generation. You'll recall that before the Reformation, the Bible was chained to the pulpit. And nobody had access to the Word of God. Chained to the pulpit. And now today, anywhere we are, wherever we are, we have the access to the Word of God. People used to, people even today in, in persecuted countries risk their lives to have a copy of the Word of God. Another video I just thought of, I should have brought it, is this video of, of uh, 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 in, in the persecuted church, the underground church in China. They, they just, uh, somebody comes and he brings this underground church a box of Bibles. 
they open this box and these people just grab these Bibles and they hold it to their chest and they, they cry and they weep because they have access. They have their own copy of the Word of God. We have more access than ever before, than any previous generation. Yet in our culture, and even within the churches in our culture, we find our generation is the most Bible illiterate generation in our nation's history. This is why the enemy advances. Because God's people perish for a lack of of knowledge they don't know the word to whom much is given much is required are you putting god's word into your heart are you utilizing the ways that we have to get god's word into us that's the first way that we grow skilled in the word of god we grow skilled with the sword of the spirit is we hide it in our heart and we apply it to ourselves and to our own lives. We use the sword of the Spirit in our own lives to pierce us, to, to do business with God, where we get right with God and free from sin. The second way that we see the Word of God used is the Word in our mouth. So the Word in our heart and then the Word in our mouth. This is us proclaiming the word proclaiming the word this is how we can rebuke the devil the devil is a liar and how do you deal with liars with the truth that's how you deal with the devil with the truth with the word of god when satan comes with his lies and that's all he's got half truths which are lies when he comes with his lies you must be ready and equipped to declare the word of God. This is what Jesus did in the wilderness, isn't it? When Jesus was tempted by the devil, isn't that what he did? When the devil came to him and tempted him and attacked him, how did Jesus respond? It is written. This is what the word says. And then the devil, who's very crafty, he even comes to Jesus and he says, well, hey, this is what the Bible says. Jesus basically says, you're twisting the truth. You're twisting the word of God. Many Christians today are led astray by false teachers who twist the word of God because they have not hidden it deep within their hearts. For the word to be in Jesus' mouth, it first had to be in his heart heart we must hide God's word in our heart so that it can be in our mouth it will never come out of our mouth unless it is in our heart the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so what you put into your heart will be what comes out of your mouth so if you're gonna have the sword that that rebukes the devil the, the sword in your mouth that, that fights the spiritual battles, you first have to put it into your heart. And this is that, that weapon that sets other people free. We read about it in 2 Corinthians 10. We have divine weapons that destroy strongholds. That's setting people free from lies with the truth. For us to be able to speak it, it first has to be in here. It has to be in here. It has to be so ingrained in us that when we are presented with arguments, when we are presented with lies, when we are presented with deceptions, that immediately we say, no, this is what the word says. It is written. It is written. This rebukes the devil. This sets other people free, men and women. Uh, Troy mentioned this tonight when, when we were praying people who are broken all around, people who are held captive by darkness, that they might hear the liberating word of the gospel and be set free by Christ. But it must be in here before we can proclaim it. Isaiah the prophet said this. He said, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. 
He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me like a polished arrow. He hid me in his quiver. Are you like a sharp sword to the Lord? Are you a weapon the Lord can use? What is in your mouth? What comes out of your mouth? It's a reflection of what's going on in your heart. If it's not faith, if it's not truth, if it's not love, if it's not the gospel, it's because those things have not been pressed into your heart by hiding God's word in your heart. Revelation 19, let's go to Revelation 19, final passage here tonight. Revelation chapter 19. Verse 11. Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a, with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This picture of Christ victorious, Christus victor, Christ victorious, riding on a white horse with a sword, not in his hand, but a sword in his mouth. What is that sword? It is the word of God. Of God. And this picture of Christ ruling the nations, dis discipling the nations, striking down those who oppose him. I, I, I see in this an imagery of God's people there with him that through us today, if the sword is in our mouth, we are to wage victorious warfare for Christ our King. This picture of Christ, again, not a sword in his hand, but a sword in his mouth. That means it is the word of God spoken, the word of God proclaimed. And you and I are called to be a part of what Christ is doing in the world as we hide his word in our heart and we proclaim it where we are. Now this starts in our hearts. It has to start in our hearts. If it doesn't start in our hearts, we'll only be Pharisees. We'll only be hypocrites. If we only proclaim the word, but we don't live the word. And that's what I'm going to deal with next week as we look at part two of using the sword of the Spirit is that it must start with us. We must apply the word first to us. But we need both. We need both the word in our heart and the word in our mouth. And the only way to get the word into our heart is to get us into the word of God.